Good morning, and welcome to NorCal PTAC's introductory webinar, How to Do Business with the Government. This webinar is a monthly event that we've been putting on to help folks just like you who are curious about government procurement and looking to get into it, looking to find out what it really takes. And that's what we're going to discuss today. My name is Amanda. I'm the program assistant for NorCal PTAC, and today I'm joined by our fantastic procurement specialist, Thomas Burns. He'll be presenting the bulk of this presentation. And before I go ahead and pass it off to him, I do want to let you know a little bit about what the PTAC program is. So PTAC is a nationwide program funded by federal and state grants that are here to assist you and your business in the government procurement marketplace. There are 96 PTACs nationwide and seven are located in California. And if you notice on this map, this green up at the top left corner is NorCal PTAC. Now that is our service area. We can only help businesses within our service area but as you see, the nationwide program can cover you no matter where you are. As for NorCal PTAC, we offer absolutely no cost procurement assistance in three different pillars. We offer our golden star of one on one counseling, where we pair you with a procurement specialist just like Thomas Burns and often could be Thomas Burns, to help you with almost anything and everything related to government procurement, from registering in SAM.gov to reviewing proposals and bids before you submit them. On top of this one-on-one -on -one counseling, we also offer bid matching, which is a paid-for service on our end that we offer to you at absolutely no cost. Now, what this bid matching does is it sends you a list of solicitations directly to your inbox based on criteria that you and your procurement specialist figure out are what you're looking for. And that can be huge because finding the bids is, it's a challenge. <laughs> There's so many websites and so many local agencies and a lot of registrations and sign up to get notifications. So bid matching is a huge boon to our clients. And our third pillar, the one that is available to clients and non-clients, no matter where you are, are all of our resources and trainings, including this webinar. We offer resources and trainings on our website for absolutely no cost. And you don't even have to be in our service area. So, if you are interested in uh, getting our free assistance and are within our service area, please do sign up at norcalptac.org. Now, if you aren't in our service area, don't worry. Again, we have 96 centers across the US and you can find your local PTAC at aptac-us.org, that link right there. And again, you will be getting all of these slides with all of these links, so you'll be able to find it later. And just to give you a wider view of all the different services that we can offer you, such as crafting capability statements, and doing market research to post award support and making sure you're compliant with everything you need to be, to getting on GSA schedules or applying for a SBIR grant. We can do a lot and you won't know if you don't call. So please feel free to give us a call at any time if you have any questions. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Thomas Burns. Thomas, it does look like you are muted. Sorry about that, I forgot, okay. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, again, uh, Amanda, appreciate your help. Thank you very much. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Burns. I'm a procurement specialist here at NorCal PTAC. I've been with NorCal PTAC for our, uh, well, over two years now. And as you can see, this is kind of my, my background. I've been doing uh, coaching, consulting, working with clients for a number of years. Um, yeah, I really enjoy the work I do with NorCal PTAC. It allows me to provide that direct support and assistance uh, to help their business grow, focusing on government contracting. And wanted to do a quick disclosure. So these webinars that we do, we try to use the most current update information, but in the government arena, things do change at the drop of a hat sometimes. Rules do change automatically without our notice. So we're providing you with the most current information to the best of our ability based on things that they are as of right now. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, this is our agenda for today. We've already talked about what is uh, the PTEC program. So now we're gonna get into what is government contracting. Okay, so here we're looking at, on the left side, what we would consider the most popular types of products and services that are purchased by government entities. So we're talking the federal, states, cities, county, transportation districts, school districts, any entity or organization that is utilizing our tax dollars to purchase products and services. And then of course on the right, these are the products and services that are normally never really purchased by the government. There's always an exception of course, but for the most part, the services on the right are not utilized by the government. Um, we will be having an opportunity to, I'll, I'll, have, I'll stop throughout the process and answer questions. Um, so just let me know. And here is a, here's a good example. Now this of course um, is a, just a list of what one institution purchases. This is a state institution. However, it, it, the reason we utilize this slide here is because this can go for a city, this can go for a transportation, um, like a, a bus company, you know, the, the bus services, BART, light rail, um, airports even, you know, there's so many things that the government does end up purchasing. And here is a structure for what we consider larger prime contracts. So the, the, the government needs a bridge bill. The government needs a complete road re renovation. Uh, the government needs some type of building demolished, demolished and a new one built. So they're gonna normally utilize one company, a prime contractor. And then from that, the prime contractor is mandated to, if the con let's say the contract is worth $10, $10 million, the prime then is mandated to spend anywhere from 10, 20, 30% of that contract with subcontractors. So in, in effect, the, the government is allowing or mandating that the opportunities for small businesses uh, comes through this process versus breaking the contract up into 20 different functions. They leave it all in one group and then mandate that the prime hire subcontractors and the government agency it will make sure that that's taking place. So this is a, a normal process for larger projects. Oops, sorry about that. Um, let me stop here and see if, were there any questions, Amanda? Yeah, it looks like we have two questions. Um, actually, just one. Someone was wondering if there's possibilities to do business as a nonprofit with the government, or is it only for small for-profit businesses? So typically nonprofits don't do business with the federal, I mean, not what I won't say federal, but with government entities, but there, there's always an exception. So the answer is yes. Depending on what product or service that nonprofit is offering, 
there are opportunities to do business with the government as a nonprofit. I'm trying to quickly come up with an example because I actually do have a client. I have a client, they, they are a nonprofit. Oh, okay, I remember. So the client that I work with that is a nonprofit, they have created a new invention, you know, a new way of providing services to the homeless community that they work with. And they are looking for additional funding to improve their product and then take this product and deliver it nationwide. So in the federal government, there's something called the SBIRs and STTRs. Those are grants, but they're grants that are awarded to normally companies or universities for the purpose of developing technology and to make it so that it's available throughout the United States. So that's, that's one example. They're, they're, they're still looking for grant money, but they're going through the federal government's SBIR, STTR process. That's, that's one, one example. But okay. normally nonprofits just don't fit in this category. Yeah, and I do wanna know, I believe that's one of the only situation in which PTAX can work with nonprofits. Yeah, we could work with nonprofits if they're going after SBIRs and STTRs. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. And it looks like we do have a few more questions coming in. Um, Davey wants to know if there are opportunities for commercial goals like ecology or elements similar. Not understanding the question. What do you mean? So it looks like he might be in like an ecological services company. Oh, that's well, what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. So the, the answer is yes. I mean, there's everything from uh, the federal agencies that are charged with our climate, climate change, um, pollution control. If, if that's what he's talking about, that's all, also available on the state level, too. Yeah, and I know a lot of uh, prime contractors, contractors may be required to have like environmental surveys or oh, that kind of thing. That's, that's, that's on all levels. Yeah. So if that's what he's he or she is talking about, then yes, that's available on local level in terms of cities, counties, states, and federal governments. That's actually a very popular category of, of service. Fantastic. And then... Lanita was asking if there's a cap for small businesses to become a prime contractor. No, there is no cap. You no can cap. go from being a small business to a prime. It's just a matter of your capacity, right, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, what you can do. Yeah, what you can do. And of course, competition. So if you're a, if you're a quote, technically small uh, firm going after a $20 million contract, um, there's nothing to say you can't win, but the competition with the larger firms and what they offer the government might be a daunting task that you never win. But again, there's no rule that says that you can't, as a small business, win a contract worth $20, 30000000 million. Fantastic. It's more and about competition. Yeah. <laughs> and Davey did write back to clarify he does advertisements for TV, oh. and I know... Advertising okay. so, yes. is common. Yes, yeah. Marketing, advertising is very common. Fantastic. And we do have a few more questions, but we'll go ahead we'll, we'll and move push forward. on. We'll work yeah. on those in the middle of the process. Yes. Okay. So this slide just covers, are you ready to go after government contracts, right? I mean, there are certain things you have to do before you start the process of going after government contracts. It, it's, it's different from that standpoint in, in terms of the prime. I mean, I'm sorry, in terms of the private sector. So in the private sector, of course, you, you get your license and you just take off and you, you, you start the process of doing your marketing, doing your sales, and the harder you work, the more that business comes to you. But in the government area, it's a little different because when you're dealing with government entities, Yes, they need those products and services, but the contracting officers who are usually the people in charge of actually hiring the company to do the work, they are kind of mandated to look for firms that have some experience 
And the, the way that they look at that is that what we call past performance, but sales, you know, do you have sales in the past? And how much of that do you have that's related to government contracting? <clears throat> so breaking in is always difficult. We, we, we're very clear about that. It's, it's not just a, an easy process to one day you're doing business on the private side and then the next day you're doing business on the government side. It is a little bit of a challenge when it comes to past performance, but that's one of the hurdles that, that you have to overcome. Now, how you overcome that is having some kind of prior sales in the private industry. You can use that to show your professionalism and your past performance. But having zero sales, you don't want to start going after government contracts and you have no sales at all. So start the process of getting sales in the private sector, then transition into government contracts. And everything else is, of course, extremely important, right? Make, making sure you do market research to figure out what agencies you should go after. Um, it's very unrealistic to feel that or to think that, okay, I'm going to do federal contracts, state contracts, city contracts, county contracts, and I'm going to go after uh, BART or the airports. It's much easier to select an industry an agency and stay focused in that group in the beginning. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna move to the next slide. All right, so getting started. These are the, the things that you absolutely must do and have when you're starting the process of going after government contracts. Uh, one, you, you do wanna get some assistance from uh, any PTAC. It just makes the process easier. Uh, second, you have to know your NAICS codes. It's, it's like rhymes with cakes. NAICS codes and your UNSPSC codes. If you've never heard of the, the UNSPSC codes, that's because they're not utilized in the federal uh, space, but they are utilized in the state of California. I don't know if they're utilized in other states, Texas, Utah, Oregon. I'm not sure, but I know in California, when they're just determining an industry class, they use UNSPSC codes versus NAICS codes. And then registering on Cal eProcure is a must if you want to do business in the state of California or with the state, I'm sorry, with the state of California, not in the state. So if you wanna be a registered vendor, bid, being able to bid on contracts for the state of California, you have to register with Cali Procure. If you wanna do business with the federal government, you have to register with SAM and get your UEI number. Along with getting your UEI, you also have to complete your dynamic small business search. This makes it possible for any federal agency to be able to go into the, uh, the, the DSBS, Dynamic Small Business Search database and look for businesses that have the products and services they're looking for. So you wanna also, after you do your SAM, you do your, your, your dynamic small business search process. Then you wanna create a capability statement. We're gonna go over that more at the end of this presentation. And for if you do have a website and we recommend that you do, you make sure you devote at least one page to government contracting. That lets them know that you're serious about doing business with the government. And let's talk about quickly socioeconomic certifications. So in the state of California, there's really, they, there's three. Um, the, the middle one, small business for public works is just for construction. But basically you have a small business certification and a DVBE certification for the state of California. In the federal government, you have this group. You have the self-certifying small business, which is the, the first one when you register in SAM and you state that you are a small business, then you are self-certifying that, hey, I'm a small business. But for the woman-owned veteran, the hub zone, the 8A and the, the DBE, 
those all require an application process. It can be lengthy because the government does move a little slow and it is free, of course. All certifications with any government entity are always free. Now, I'll stop here and take a few questions. Fantastic. Um, we have a couple folks asking if there's a benchmark for the amount of past sell or sales you have to have to be in government procurement. Is there a benchmark they should do or they should meet with their revenue before they start applying for contracts? No, I, I wouldn't say there's a benchmark. And more so that you just have to have some past performance. And again, because we're dealing with so many different agencies and so many different needs, there's no way to say there's a benchmark, right? It could be one, as long as you have one past performance that you can document on a capability statement, that might be enough for, for one type of agency, depending on if it's a product or service. I will say this, if it's a product, you're selling computers, you're selling hardware, you're selling um, furniture. If it's a product, it's it's always about price, right? It, it's 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 extremely focused on the lowest price and the availability to get the product to them when they need it. And, and so, past performance is not as important. But if you're a service, if you're a consultant, if you do you know, sit, sit, and I'm thinking about California in the wild in the fire season. So, if you provide some kind of service to Cal Fire or to uh, um, construction, and you're a contractor, and you provide some kind of service, having some kind of past performance is more important. But in terms of is is there a benchmark of you know four hundred thousand dollars in sales or five thousand in sales? Nobody will give you a, a, an accurate answer on that because it, it just doesn't exist to that level. Fantastic. And I believe that will be it for now. Okay, wonderful. All right, my favorite topic, local contracting. I believe you can be extremely successful in the contracting arena if you just focus on your neighborhoods, your neighboring cities, and counties. I've seen it work. Uh, I know it works because in government contracting, one of the most important aspects that people don't talk enough about is the relationship building and how that relates to you winning and having opportunities for contracts. It is a fact. It is, is a fact with the state of California. It's a fact with cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego and with counties in California. It's a fact that the bulk of the purchasing that they do on a daily basis is not through RFPs and waiting on receiving bids and then making an award. It's the process of having a list of vendors that they already know about. And they reach out to the vendors by phone or email and say, hey, we need 5,000 hammers. Give me a quote and I need this within a week. Or we need marketing consulting services specifically for digital marketing. We want the contract to start within the next two weeks. Here are the parameters, give us a quote and they'll send that off to maybe four or five companies. And the best quote wins and they win, they win the award and they start the job. That's the majority of how contracting is done, especially on the local level. It's more expensive to do an RFP, RFP process. It's time consuming. And as long as the dollar amount is under a certain level and those levels uh, fluctuate based on the agency and based on what the product or service is. Right. Um, as a quick example, in the state of California, they can award a contract directly to some some agency. I'm sorry, to some company, without posting it 
and making the world know about it as long as they get three quotes. And that dollar amount is $250,000. So if the Department of Motor Vehicles wants to award a, a janitorial contract to, uh, to, to help them with one location, they're not looking for uh, janitorial services for all DMVs, but just for one location, it's a special situation. It may be only like twenty or thirty thousand dollars. They don't need to do an RFP. They can just reach out to two or three janitorial firms who are small businesses, because normally that's who gets those kind of contracts are the certified small businesses, and they'll give them the parameters, ask for a quote, they'll get the quote, and they'll go with the best bid. That is how it's done. 60, 70% of the time. And you have a greater opportunity to do that when you focus on local agencies like the cities, counties, school districts, and your local transportation agencies. Uh, any questions about that before I move to the next slide? Doesn't look like we have any right now. Oh, great, great. Okay, so I told you we would talk about capability statements. This is a very important document for all government, federal, state, local. They wanna see a document that makes it very easy for them to understand who you are, what you do, what are your codes, what are your certifications and your past performance. And it's a format that they like to see that makes this easy. Uh, one of the rules is it, it can't be no longer than two pages, front and back. Um, there's many different templates, but they all kind of do the same laying out the information in a way that makes it easy. So here where you see the, the how to, that's basically a link. And so you're gonna be able to see an, an entire webinar just on how to write a capability statement on our website. We've, we've done that webinar and we leave it here as a link. Here on this next page, this is also something that I offer all of my clients. Um, I give them a fr free template that we, we, are, we utilize. Um, I think this template works well, but at the same time, there are some clients, this doesn't work for them. They don't need two pages because they're a new company and they don't have enough information. So they put everything just on one page, which is fine. Um, but this one allows you to have bios, pictures. Now the pictures are important as long as they're really highlighting your company. You know, if, if you're in the marketing business and you wanna highlight some of the work you've done, then the pictures could do a, a good job of that. Especially if you're in the photography, um, visual arts, you know, there are a lot of different ways and reasons for having photos with your uh, capability statement. Another one is if you have, uh, let's say, eight, nine employees, you want to highlight that you have a large staff. You're not just a one-person operation. So photos could do a good job of that also. But this template is available. It's available on our website. And it's available if you have a meeting with one of the procurement specialists, and we can also send that to you. Contracting ready website. This is also extremely important. The government, whether it's again, federal, state, local, they all utilize websites to a really large degree. And in fact, I don't know how many people are have a LinkedIn page for their company or a LinkedIn profile for them personally. But if you haven't been paying attention, all government entities are on LinkedIn now. So if you wanna know about the, the personnel that work for the FEMA or the personnel that work for the DMV in California or the city of San Francisco or the Alameda County here in, in the Bay Area. There's a, there's a LinkedIn page for that agency. And then there's a personnel page that is say there are you know, 500 people 
listed as employees of Alameda County. And so you can find people. It, they, they, they love the internet. They're utilizing it in a large degree and they want their vendors, the people that, do, that they do business with, they wanna also see their website. And they wanna see that you're devoting at least one page to government contracting. You know, it's almost like they, they feel like you, you, you do care about doing business with the government and you've taken the time to devote a, web pay, a website, I'm sorry, a web page on your website to that. And this is information that you want to show. You know, this is examples of what you want to show on your government, government tab. Any questions about just the importance of a website and, and how to, you know, really highlight that you want to do business with the government? Looks like no questions. Um, we're seeing a few in the chat that escaped my purview. Um, it looks like Robert is working for a third party. Uh, he's asking about his chances of getting a government contract. And that's really something that a procurement specialist sitting down on one-on-one -on -one counseling can assess. It's not quite something we can really assess in a webinar. Well, I mean, if third, if third party is code for distributor, yes, distributors do business with the government. Um, if third party is I'm a rep working for a company, um, that that would require a different discussion. Fantastic. And I do see another one in the chat. The SDB with the state, is it the same as with the federal government? No. Okay. So, so the federal government's small business certification is not accepted by any state. It's only accepted by federal agencies. And on the same line, if you go ahead and sign up with Cali Vecure with the state of California, you get the SB certification. It's not going to be accepted by the federal government. It's just for the state of California. Fantastic. And it looks like Ryan is asking, um, is contact info required on the website? For well, government contracting. Um, I, I won't say it's if you want to, if you don't want to have contact information on your website and just have the the contact us page where somebody fills it in for more information. I mean, I don't think that's a, a major hindrance or anything, no. Um, but I think you should have your capability statement that they can download. And on the capability statement, you're going to have your contact information. That is a mandatory thing. Fantastic. And then we did have one more question about the website. Does it need to say that you're already working with the government or that you are looking to work with the government? I, I, it doesn't need to say that you're already working with the government. It doesn't need to say that you're looking to. It just needs to say, this is how we, this is the products and services we provide to the government. So Fantastic. something along those lines, this is what we do, not what we want to do or we have done, but this is what we do. Awesome. And I believe we can go on from there. Wonderful. All right, my other second uh, most popular topic is marketing. How do you market to the government? Um, following the logic of Focusing on local contracting as a starting point, it's, again, it's just easier. You, you can build relationships a little bit faster locally than you can on a state level and definitely on a federal level. You know, there, of course, there are exceptions, but by and large, it's much easier process of starting the co contracting opportunities on a local level. With that mindset, then marketing is about understanding your, who you wanna do business with and, and keeping less is more attitude. You know, instead of saying as, a, as, as you're starting into government contracting, instead of saying, I'm going to do business 
I'm gonna sign up as a vendor with 20 cities and five counties and 15 school districts. What if I say, you know, I'm only gonna focus on school districts or I'm only gonna focus on these five cities surrounding where I live, my own city and the, the neighboring cities around me. And remember for every city, for every county and definitely in, in, in the state, there's all these different departments. So should you focus on park and recreation? Should you focus on general services because you are, you're in the construction and they handle construction, the general services or public works? Should you focus on um, health and human services agencies because you're in that industry? You know, it, it's about doing some research to understand who should you focus on within government? What departments within a city? What departments within a county? It's not just doing business with the county, it's doing business with that specific department within the county. That's, that's how you wanna look at it because the county itself doesn't know what it needs, but the departments do. Each individual department is where you wanna spend your attention and, and focus. And remember, you're looking for those 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, $100,000 contracts as a starting point. And so knowing who the buyers are within a department, learning who the managers are that the buyers support, right? The buyer's job is to purchase products and services for the managers who actually need those products and services to do what that agency is supposed to do. So knowing who those people are, that's marketing. That's how you develop your marketing plan and your target audience. All of that is what we're trying to do. And then that goes along with establishing relationships. And you can do all these things by attending different types of networking events that these government agencies put on. Um, again, social media, I, it, it mentions LinkedIn. I can't stress, it's, it's extremely valuable. It's a free tool. They, they tell you, hey, I'm Thomas Burns and I, and I work for uh, the, the city of San Francisco. I'm in the public works department and I'm a contracting officer. You know, that's all on LinkedIn. Um, any questions about marketing to the government real quick? Yeah, we do have one. Um, is there opportunity for group purchasing organization to work with veteran homes for home medical supplies and food needs? Have you seen any kind of solicitations for that or so group purchasing? I, I have seen where on a federal and state level, I haven't seen this locally, but on federal and state level, there are what they call cooperatives, right? A cooperative or a co-op. So a group of states, or a group of agencies will pool their resources together to get a lower purchase price. So if they, if all of the agencies need beds, as an example, because you're talking about veterans homes, so they all need beds. So they might get a tw 20 different veterans homes might kind of create a cooperative and force a distributor or manufacturer to provide them beds at a set price. Um, if that's not what you're really asking about in your question, the answer is yes, they will purchase directly from a distributor or a, manu or a manufacturer um, a veteran's home. Fantastic. All right, so where to find these bid opportunities? So there are many places, but these are the most common. Of course, the local agency website. You go directly to the city, the county, that transportation agency, that school district, you go directly to their website and you're looking for the procurement tab or the do business with, you know, name your city or county tab. Um, also prime contractor websites. So if you're looking to, especially for construction, you know, you want to, be a subcontractor for Turner Construction or WebCore or 
Swinnerton, then you've got to, to go to their website and sign up as a subcontractor. Cali Procure, that's the main link to go directly to the state of California and their bid page. SAM is the main tool for federal government. Um, not every single federal product or service that's needs to be purchased will be listed on SAM, but 80% of them are. So any agency in the federal side that needs to buy a product or service that's normally over $100,000, and that, of course, that's normal. It's it's not the, it, it's there's always exceptions, but most of the products that are over a hundred thousand dollars will be listed on SAM.gov. Acquisition.gov is a great tool also because it allows you to go quickly to the federal. It's it's only for the federal government. Go to their website and look at their, what they call forecasted projections what they will need to buy over the next six to 12 months. That's what acquisition.gov is great for. And then of course, our bid match service and associations like Building Exchange have lists of upcoming opportunities. And let me do a, a quick uh, in summary. So these are the 10 things to get yourself ready to be successful starting the process of government contracting. First of all, yes, you wanna make sure you're ready applying for uh, PTAC services. But, but I would say when it comes to getting certified and creating your capability statement, you know, those updating your websites, all those things are important, but really you wanna start the process of building relationships, understanding where you should be doing business, where the opportunities lay for your firm for what you do, that, that's gonna be first, doing some market research first before you start your capability statement, because you might end up just having to change it once you understand, you know what, I should be focused on these counties and not these cities and for these reasons, and they need to see this. So I need to change my capability st statement to focus on this area more. I think market research is the, is the most important out of these 10 steps. Doing your homework before you start the process of talking to the agencies and understanding. But once you start, just it's consistent, you know, like anything in business. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. I would say on, you know, and that's a, that's a question we get a lot is how long will it take before I get my first contract? And it depends on so many factors. Are you just looking to bid and you're submitting bid after bid after bid? Or are you taking the time to build relationships? And does that take one month? Does it take two months? You know, when does that agency need to buy my product and service? Maybe they just bought what I sell a week ago and I gotta wait six weeks or I gotta wait six months before they're ready to purchase again. Um, so those are, there's so many questions. I can't give you a, a, a pat answer um, to answer that question, but doing your homework first in terms of marketing research will help you identify the opportunities. And um, these are our procurement specialists. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Amanda Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll be going into our Q&A. But just before that, I do want to make you aware of a few other events we have going on this month, some really exciting ones. We have How to Do Business with specifically the state of California being presented tomorrow, actually, on the state of California's birthday. They've been buying from you for 172 years. And we want to help them buy from you for even longer. And then later on in the month, Caltrans is presenting a resource roundtable in which we will be participating in on Tuesday, September 20th. And we also have another webinar at the end of this month, how to properly estimate for construction projects with our fantastic procurement specialist, Ed Duarte. And that'll be Monday, September 6th, 26th 
at 4 p.m., a little bit later in the afternoon. And with that, we do have a few questions and I will be skimming through the chat. Sure. But first off, Lenita wanted to know if their business is transportation, are you able to apply for other contracts that aren't related to that, like photography or janitorial, if you do that anyway? So you wanna, so your focus is transportation, but you also have other areas of business such as photography. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, there's no, there's not, no rule that says you can't. It's just competition. Yeah, would you say it's, it's good to have at least like some past performance in that area to be competitive? Well, yes. So having past performance is always a key. Regardless, having past performance is always a key. Fantastic. And then I do have a few chat questions. Um, Daniel asked if he has to be a corporation or LLC, or can he be a sole proprietorship and you can still be a sole get these proprietor. contracts? You can be a sole prop. There are many sole props that have contracting success. Fantastic. And it looks like Ryan wanted to know how you would recommend finding out about expos and matchmaking or conferences that oh, they can attend. On, on the websites of the agency you want to do business with, they should have an events page. If they don't and you want to know, do they offer any kind of matchmaking or anybody, any kind of upcoming events that helps you understand how to do business with them, reach out directly. Reach out directly to the procurement directors or the how to do business profiles or pages that they have listed on their website and just ask those questions if it's not shown available on a website. But by and large, if it's, if it's a larger city, they will have an events page. But I could see certain smaller cities or a utility company, a water company, um, a smaller electrical, electrical company may not be having any events at all. So there might not be anything to show, but you can reach out by phone. Uh, to me, the phone is your, is your most important tool. If you can take the time, be professional and make good phone calls, you learn so much so quickly. Fantastic. And we've gone over a lot of information today. And I actually wanted to end on a very good question we got very early on in the webinar. Thomas, what advice do you have for a brand new company who's looking to get into government procurement? Again, I think you, you should have some success with selling your product or service on the private side first, and then use that as your past performance when you start going into government contracting. The, the challenge with going after government contracts, whether you're doing bidding or reaching out directly and trying to promote your, your company, if you have no sales yet, the contracting officer is just going to be leery. And there's so many other businesses that they can turn to who do have past performance, who do have experience that they can document in a capability statement. So if you haven't any sales yet, I suggest start with going into the private side first and then taking those successful sales on the private side and using it as your past performance. And then one little last question, Donna wants to know, how do you prove this past performance or how do you prove oh, that you have these sales? You just document it in a capability statement. The, that, that's the power of a capability statement. They will take it as, as, as truth as long as it looks professional and you've documented. So a past performance will say, um, you name of the company, the time frame you worked, you know, whether it was a week, one day or a six month contract with some private instance, depending on what you sell, right? If, if you're a consultant or some type of service-based, there was some kind of time frame, right? Whether you work for them for a week or for a month and they paid you anywhere from you know, 500 to $500,000, whatever the payment was, and you document what you did. You just state in 
maybe four or five sentences. And there's examples in that capability statement template that we have, there's examples of past performance and how it's recorded on the capability statement. So it's, it's really that simple. Just putting it on the capability statement is documenting. Now, when it comes to doing an RFP, they're gonna want more information, which, which stands for request for proposals, right? And so submitting a proposal is a whole different webinar, right? That's a whole different thing to talk about. I can't cover all of that in, in, at the end of this, but that's where you would highlight your past performance is inside a proposal that you would be submitting on a contract opportunity. Fantastic. And that's all the questions we have for today. Yeah, these are these are really good questions. Yeah, and they require more follow up, but pay attention to like this has been recorded. And so you can download the recording. You you have these slides and the information on our website gives you more information to help you with those questions to give you more information or sign up for services and we can definitely, there's nine of us, so uh, we definitely have time and the ability to work with as many clients as possible. Absolutely, and if you aren't in our service area but are looking for PTAC services, check out this link down here on this slide, AppTAC, and they can help you find your local PTAC office where you can get the same services at no cost. And with that, I wanted to thank you all for joining us. I do want to remind you that you will be receiving the recording and the slides with all active links later on today directly to your inbox. And at the end, when this webinar is concluded, it will redirect you to our survey, which just gives us an idea of how we did. We love to always get your feedback as we do this to help you. And if we can be helping you in other ways, in different ways, we want to know. So please, that's invaluable information. And we always love to hear from you guys. So with that, I will go ahead and thank you for your time. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.